Um, yeah, so I'm Mike McMillan. I'm here to talk to you guys about SEO. Um, does everyone in the room understand, at least at a high level, what SEO is? Show of hands, what's SEO? Or who knows what SEO is? Sweet. Two hands from Gavin, great. Um, <laughs> How many people are using SEO or tech techniques to improve their organic traffic right now for their sites? This is awesome. All right. Okay. I prepared a little bit of an intro course, so I apologize if it seems a, a little beginner for people. But my goal here was to kind of just empower people and give them. A, but we can kind of get into more Q and A a little bit later on. And if you guys want to ask more advanced questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, according to Moz, uh, search engine optimization is the practice of increasing the quality and, and quantity of traffic to your website through organic search uh, engine results. Generally, um, SEO hasn't, it has changed from a technical standpoint, but it, the rudimentary uh, elements of SEO are pretty much the same. It's about creating content that people want. Uh, it's about having authority from other places that are pointing back to your site that are giving, giving a little bit of a boost, and just having a technically sound site. So why should you guys listen to me about WordPress and SEO? Uh, I've worked in the digital world since 1999. Uh, I've been breaking and fixing WordPress sites since about 2010. More of a hobbyist than a developer. Uh, and uh, I've focused on improving organic visibility since about 2011. And I'm currently leading the SEO team, as, I, as was mentioned in my uh, little quick bio there, uh, at Verb Interactive, which has grown from a team of uh, two to three people in the, about four years ago to a team of, uh, I think, we yeah, were about nine, and the analytics team has broken off and done its own thing. A little bit of a disclaimer, although I work for Verb, um, Verb, although they completely uh, support that I'm here talking, uh, all the opinions and everything I express right now, are, it's my, my uh, content. Uh, so don't hold Verb accountable for anything I say, uh, although a lot of my work with them has uh, allowed, allowed me to uh, learn all these things. If you guys are sick of PowerPoints, um, I'm going to, I've got this URL here that's got a list of all the tools I'm going to go through. Uh, WordCamp2018.seobrunch.com. Right now it's literally list of, a laundry list of, of tools. Um, I'm going to post my uh, presentation to it and uh, if there's any really specific questions I think is worth digging into, I'm going to post it to this uh, in the next couple days as well. So let's jump right into uh, keyword research I think would be a really interesting topic to start with. So. One of the tools, uh, is everyone familiar with Google Search Console or Webmaster Tools from back in the day? Who's played with that new beta version? Show of hands. Isn't it pretty awesome? Like we could filter and drill down. I, I think it's a great tool for figuring out uh, where, and I still call it Webmaster Tools. Um, digging into a Search Console, and if you guys haven't gotten into the beta version, I'll show you how to go into there. I'm just going to bring up one of my personal sites. Uh, up in here, try the new Search Console. So interface looks a whole lot better. It doesn't look like the old Google uh, Search Console as it once was. Um, but this performance spot I find is really great for kind of determining what keywords you're already ranked for. Um, before you start trying to optimize and get yourself ranking for other keywords, it's a good idea to kind of look to see what you're already ranking for because you don't want to destroy it. You don't want to break it if it's already working. So it's a great opportunity to kind of just figure out what, what your, uh, your existing keywords. Good opportunity to identify striking distance keywords. If you're not familiar with that term, striking distance keyword would be the bottom of first page, uh, top of second page, sometimes third page. And it generally saying if it's in a striking distance, there's a lot of signals there already that's saying this is the right content for the query that's coming up. Uh, it's just a matter of probably a few things that your competitors are doing that can push you up into that converting position, which generally is that first to fifth position, although there are people that go a little bit deeper and get into like second page. Uh, but generally speaking, most people don't go past those first couple of results in the search result. So if we dig into this performance section, I think this is really amazing. And when it came out, I think this, a lot of this information was available, but just not in the interface that it was. Uh, digging in here, I like to com compartmentalize content. So We'll look at like all the blog content as a whole, or if, um, let's say you have articles on, on a site, you can kind of drill down there. But if you want to dig in to specific pages, I'm going to turn off a plug and that's just going to give us way too much information. And we'll get into that one later. But um, bear with me for a minute. 
I guess first off, I'd like to say, does everyone have analytics on your, your site? OK. If you uh, need to learn more about analytics, I think an analytics allows you to know kind of where you're performing well, where there's holes. It gives you the tools to kind of figure out other things. Without analytics, you can't kind of really determine what's performing. Uh, my colleague, Enrique, who's sitting up in the front here, is giving a talk at 3 o'clock. He's going to go uh, over some uh, explanations on like how to process some of this data and, uh, and, and make it actionable, usable things for yourselves. So generally what I would do is if I'm trying to figure out why a site's not performing well or I want to try to find an opportunity, I'll go and see what's already ranking. and Sorry, not what's already ranking, but what's already driving most of the traffic for a site. And then you can take that information and dig into Google Search Console. So I, I put together a personal site, and it's never meant to do anything other than just to collect my random thoughts. And uh, I was doing some independent consulting about five years ago. And uh, I don't know if anybody's an independent consultant and trying to figure out when you're supposed to charge GST and when you're not. And I don't know if you've tried to find the answer to that. But it's all the answers I found were pretty convoluted. The Revenue Canada site is like you need a degree in, in legal to kind of understand what the heck they're talking about. Um, so I, I went and collected a lot of that information together and just wrote a post about it because I was kind of curious about it and it allowed me kind of to bring my thoughts together. So I wasn't even trying to rank for this, but for some reason my own personal site ranks really high for GST number for contractor, independent contractor Ontario HST. I have no idea why it ranks for this, um, but it, it, it's driving a little bit of traffic. And I'm going to use this as, as an example because with uh, Google Search Console we can drill down uh, we can get into the pages here. So as you can see, these are my top performing pages. One about cooking pork chops with apple, uh, apples and port wine. Two clicks, really, and 111 impressions. That's not driving any traffic. My own personal site has one click. But this GST uh, number has, and this is over the last three months, almost 1,000 uh, clicks from 10,000 impressions. So a click-through rate of 9.4%. So this is a pretty well-performing site. If you want to determine kind of what you're already ranking for. What I like to do is I could drill this down to blog content, but specifically I'm going to go in here and switch over to the query section. And then I'm going to export this data and take it straight into Sheets. Google Sheets, great tool. It's free. You can do a lot of things you can't do with Excel. Um, and then from here, we've got a list of all the queries. And what I like to do is uh, I'll do a color coding for click-through rate and then kind of sort by clicks and then look at impressions too because there's a lot of impressions you've got a lot of opportunity there to grow and so this is kind of my initial approach to kind of determine what, what we're already ranking for and looking for opportunities to improve that. Does anybody have any questions about Google Search Console? Is anybody using it to this capacity or has other techniques that kind of have worked for them? <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. I tell you, when I did, I didn't realize that there was like a one to the left of it, so I thought the big blue line was like, oh, yeah. Yes, so yeah. It was like one. <laughs> One's better than zero. <laughs> um, so that's a great way to determine what you're already ranked for. There's also lots of tools out there, and th most of them are subscription based. Um, I personally use Bright Edge, it's uh, a great tool, but it's uh, something we use uh, in house at Burb. Um, there's other tools. I find SEM Rush is a good one for the price point, and a lot of people are using that tool and find it very uh, powerful. Um, but determining what you can rank for, um, one tool I've liked to use is Answer the Public. Is show of hands, who's ever used Answer the Public or ever seen this site? Sweet. All right. Answer the Public. So what we're trying to do is determine what kind of questions people are asking us are asking about the type of product. So Answer the Public. It's got this this uh, this guy who kind of look. He'll look a little perturbed after a little while if you take your time. Um, but if you want to kind of determine what questions people are asking, you could put in a high-level subject. Yeah, he's starting to get annoyed with us right now because we're taking our time. <laughs> so GST. Takes a few minutes to load up here. Just give it a minute. Internet connection's a little slow. There we go. And what you end up with here is a big, giant visual, which is great if you like, want to put this into a slide and you want to present it to people. I'm a data person, so I'm going to export this as a CSV. What this basically is giving you all the questions, and this is based on Google's um, um, sort of related queries at the bottom. That's another way to dig into like, what kind of questions people are asking. You do a search for one term, and then scroll down the bottom to find out what other people have searched. Um, but the trick to this is determining 
if there's any search volume behind any of these terms. Because people could be searching it, but it could be that there's one search per month. And really, do you want to put hours of getting content written, do you like redeveloping work, uh, just in order to rank for a term that basically nobody's searching for and it's not going to convert into traffic? So another tool I like to use to help with this, I'll download the CSV. And I'm going to turn on another tool called Keywords Everywhere. And there's links to all these in that blog post that I talked about earlier. We'll open up this giant CSV of tons and tons of queries. Copy it over. Get into Keywords Everywhere. Bulk upload the keywords. These are both uh, free tools as well. Dump them in here. Now there's quite a few to go through, almost 900. And from here, we can export another CSV and really quickly drill down to find out what questions people are not only asking, but also have multiple people are asking it. So. Again, I like to plop this into the Google Sheets. Uh, I'll sort, sort by search volume. Do it the other way around, so you don't care about the zeros. There we go. So you get some quite what it what G what GST is. Uh, it looks to be probably the first one that I would kind of start exploring, and this helps you kind of determine what kind of blog content you can talk about, what subject you have, what questions people are asking, how can you answer that question. And there's a couple great opportunities with this. One thing you can create blog content you can share through your social um, uh, avenues and other avenues like that, but also you can take that. Um, uh, information, and uh, if you can get yourself into that quick answer position, like I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm going to take a wild guess here, but what GST is, we'll, prop, we'll end up with a quick answer result and at the very top. So a good opportunity here with that, not only do you have that visibility of being right at the very top here, and that's also a neat thing about that Keywords Everywhere tool, as you search things, you will literally see keywords everywhere, and you'll get the search volume, and it's all sorted by that. So there's great opportunities. Ideas can just come from anything from you just kind of surf on the web. Um, but having yourself in this top position is really powerful because of the, the big buzz around voice search right now. If anybody has a Google Home or Amazon Echo, um, I've experimented more with uh, the Google Home than the Echo or Siri. Uh, but with the Google Home, um, the, this top result, if you ask the question, what is GST, or what GST is, which kind of reads a little bit awkward, I would probably switch it around, but um, this result from Invest Investopedia will be what comes up in Google Home. Now, you can't properly attribute that with analytics. Uh, not currently. There has been rumors, Google said last summer, that they were going to release a way to attribute this properly. And I don't know, maybe Enrique might be able to talk to this later if there's any way to attribute voice search at this point. Yeah, it comes up as direct none. But it's a great brand awareness. It, it can get you up in those search results. And it, it's great bragging rights uh, if you're going to a client and say, hey, when you, we've been writing about this GST for a while. When I say what GST is, um, you guys come up top in, in the Google Home. It's a great opportunity there. Um, so if you have yourself in a position, you've determined your keywords. And I would like to determine about one. One focus keyword per page where it's logical, they're going to have pages that just aren't your privacy policy. You're not going to want to rank for privacy policy or your disclaimers, uh, stuff like that. Your login page, you're never going to want to rank there. But for your content, I'd say your blog content, your articles, your main page, your main products, you should have determined a focus keyword, particularly non-branded, um, that you're going to optimize for. So um, if most people in here are operating with WordPress sites, how many people are using Yoast? Yeah, most of the room. How many people are using all-in-one? I've worked with like two of you before. Yeah, that makes sense. I like all-in-one myself. Uh, it's a little bit, um, little. I wouldn't say bare bones, but it's a not as not as user friendly. And but if it doesn't have as many bells and whistles, but it it, it does the job. And there's uh, it's it's a great tool. But Yoast, I find if I was going to prepare a site for a client, I would use yeah. Excuse me, I would use Yoast first, uh, just because it's a little bit more uh, intuitive. Uh, it's a little bit more user friendly. And I actually got the opportunity to log into it as, while I was preparing for this because it had been a little while. And it's really grown to be something a lot different. So if everyone doesn't have any specific questions about what we talked about, I'd like to go in through Yaos and kind of show you how I would set things up. Cool? Last hour. There'll be more opportunities for more questions too at the end. But you had a question in the back? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And it shows on the back end, but when you go to the page, nothing comes up. Oh. Right. We sh let's talk afterwards. Because I, I have a feeling there's a couple things that could be, and I don't want to just kind of guess, but I, I, have a, I can think of about three or four uh, ideas. So basically the question was uh, if, if they prepared the blog post and it's not showing up, what, what could be happening? Uh, and by not showing up, you mean this, it doesn't show up on the site? Um, so for Yoast, This is free, the free version, yes. And it's a great product. If you want to get into video site maps, I highly recommend the paid version. Um, it help, excuse me, allows you to get some support as well. But the free version can do a lot of these uh, aspects um, without having to kind of, yeah, shell out the money. All-in-One as well has a free version, and there's a premium version as well. But for like a, a, a site that's just kind of starting out, I, they're bo both free versions will do pretty much everything you need. And uh, everything I'm going to go over today is, is available in the free version. Uh, they do have this first-time SEO configuration wizard, which I, I haven't clicked because I'd already kind of half set this up. But uh, from what I, from what I've heard, it's it's a great starting point. Get in. Um, but uh, generally speaking, for search appearance, title separator would be that in your title. And if you're not familiar with your title, the title is a metadata piece of information. It's on the it, it, if you view source, you'll see it. It shows up in the the top tab. Nine times out of ten, it, most of that information will show up in a Google search result, depending on if Google feels there's other elements of it that are more relevant. Um, you're kind of always at the whim of Google when it comes to search results. And I am referencing Google most of the time because they still own the lion's share of search and uh, organic traffic. But uh, the title separator would be basically, if you have your description, or your title, excuse me, um, you'd want something to separate and go into and explain kind of your brand. Uh, it doesn't have to be on every page. If you're getting into blog content, have, that's a lot of real estate that you might want to give up uh, in favor of having a, like a long tail query. But uh, I generally like to use the pipe, mainly because um, although the measurement of characters is used a lot of the times to say how long you're supposed to make a title, it is, does come down to like a pixel width. So a pipe versus a dash just saves you that little, you might be able to get an extra letter in there. Uh, the knowledge graph section down here, um, it's, uh, it actually generates some schema. And how many people in the room are familiar with what schema is? Cool. All right. Wow, more than I thought. That's awesome. Uh, so this is going to generate some basic local business schema. Uh, it's going to attribute it to you as a company uh, and uh, give you the company name, and you can up to update the logo. And just to clarify, for the people who don't know what schema is, yes? Yeah, that, I think it's going to have to be a conversation outside. There's like lots of great opportunities with schema, and it depends on kind of the product. Um, for this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on what's auto-generated by Yoast. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to stick to kind of this local business one, but I'd love to chat with you more about this afterwards, yeah. Um, we've seen some really cool things with using event and product schema to like increase the uh, footprint in search results. Um, it's pretty powerful. Uh, so this one will just generate some high-level uh, information for what your business is. Uh, and yeah, sorry, I was going to explain to the people who don't understand what schema is. It's basically a, a standard markup language that Yahoo, Bing, I think uh, a few of the other minor search engines and Google are all working together to standardize information that they, you can mark up that can be used to either generate um, like social information or uh, it can and populate uh, additional information in the search results as well. Um, it basically allows you to highlight key points. So, if uh, yeah, this will generate some simple uh, local business schema on pretty much every page on the site. The Search Console el element here allows you to tie in uh, the the Search Console um, uh, tool into Yoast, so you can get some uh, alerts right in Yoast. Uh, I deleted my contact page the other day because that was set up by default and I just really didn't have any contact information. It's literally like a two or three page website at this point. So it's telling me that there's a 404 because uh, the site doesn't exist anymore. Um, or that page, excuse me, not the site doesn't exist anymore. So you can get some high level search console information immediately in here. Um, moving on. Search appearance, we're going to get into content types. And content types is a great opportunity Although you want to like customize your titles towards keywords that you're going after, for like 
things like blog content, you want to kind of by default already be writing for the keyword and have some sort of uh, control over what the information is based on variables. So within content types, it allows you, to, based on what post types you have in here, there's quite a few in here because uh, of the tool that I'm using, the, the template I'm using. Um, but you can, you can basically hide things from the sitemap. So show portfolio and search results, yes or no. That'll remove it from the, the sitemap. It'll also make it no index. So there's highly unlikely that it'll, it'll surface in search results. Um, there's also the opportunity here, you'll see these are variables that are set uh, by default. So you could set up basically title and site name for all your blog content. So you get a ton of information. You'll have a, a good title right off the bat. Um, when it comes to kind of defining those taxonomies, uh, I mean, media, I would keep media the way it is, redirect attached URLs. I don't think people are using like media pages. Yes? Sure. I would restrict it. It should be, but it depends kind of on the setup. Okay. So yeah, there's no point. You're, you're, you want to kind of reduce your crawl budget as well. Well, Google will go through your site. If you don't, need, you don't want something to be indexed, you can basically be polite and tell them there's no need for you to look at this information. This is all purely for users that are already logged in. Yeah. No problem. Uh, media, I would keep the way, the way it is. Taxonomies, um, generally what we have found, uh, initially I used to hide categories and tags because we always have an issue with duplicate content. But uh, as the years went on, I've been noticing that categories actually can drive a lot of traffic. So by default, I've been hiding the tags, but keeping categories available. Because things like, um, like Moz is, is pretty well known for this. They'll keep their categories, category section um, available so that when you search title information, <coughs> excuse me, it's my TF, there we go. Yes. Uh, so yeah, having categories available allows you to rank for kind of broader terms. Um, but, and also when you're thinking about taxonomies, it's useful to think of categories as kind of, you only want one or two categories per blog content. Your taxonomy, you want to probably, I'm sorry, the, when you get into tags, you want about four or five, where it makes sense. Uh, you generally use like two or three tags in one category if I can make it work. Category, think of it as the, the hierarchy taxonomy and the tag being kind of sub, -ta um, sub taxonomies, excuse me. Um, and then, uh, Moving on, I'm not going to get into the rest of these. They're just kind of author page if you're going to keep it um, available, if it makes sense. If you have authors that have a name to them that you want their page to rank, and you, that does make sense. If it's just you posting all the time, it's kind of a redundant page. I would pull it out myself, uh, depending on kind of the fame of the person that's writing. Um, moving into social. Uh, any, any questions about setting up titles, content types? Cool. All right. Um, when you get into social, social is really powerful because it gives an opportunity. Although social doesn't like directly influence um, rank, it allows setting up this is basically well. The first part here, social profiles. This is schema that's basically saying same as. Uh, so you have that opportunity in the knowledge graph for yourself if you're using same as to have your your LinkedIn show up, your uh, your Instagram, your Twitter, your Facebook, um, and it. But also moving into like Facebook and Twitter, you have an opportunity to uh, define open graph and Twitter cards, which is basically another form of structured data that tells and gives you control over when one of your pages is shared on social, what information is showed. So uh, generally we'd set this up with variables, but we can use, um, we can customize it at the custom level if you're seeing the variables aren't exactly giving you what you want and this, this is getting shared quite a bit. And by sh making things easily shareable on social media, you're basically increasing your reach and allowing people to um, share content a lot easier, which then in turn can lead them to get shared outside of, um, outside of social platforms, which is a backlink. And a backlink will improve your authority, which inherently will in improve your rank as well. Um, I've been steering away from Google Plus. Uh, I heard somebody explain it to me. It's marketers marketing to marketers. So it's kind of it, it's an interesting place to be in. I haven't been on Google Plus in a while. I don't know who's using Google Plus in the room nowadays. Not a soul. Google uses it. Yes. Sometimes you can rank better on Google because your Google Plus will show up where something else didn't. Because they like Google Plus, even though no one yeah. else Yeah. <laughs> but it has to be a really rare, sort of niche thing. Yeah. 
And it, it used to directly affect rank, and they've pulled that out since, like in the last year or two, I think. Um, Pinterest is a nice emerging social platform that I feel like not emerging is that we all know it's been around for a while, but there's a lot of, uh, we're seeing a lot of play with our social teams right now, pushing a lot of Pinterest work. It also kind of depends on what kind of product you have that you're delivering. Um, it, it makes sense to have images, um, tons of images. I would highly recommend going for Pinterest. Uh, I'm gonna dig in a little bit more into the tools. Oh yeah, sure. LinkedIn, LinkedIn doesn't have that like standard. And correct me if I'm wrong. If anybody knows separately, but from what I understand, LinkedIn doesn't have a standard like like Open Graph or Twitter card set up. Now I believe they will pull information from Open Graph to generate the inf information. We can, sorry, LinkedIn is in here, yes. Yeah, no, sorry. They didn't give it the priority. Go oh, forth. I mean, it's above MySpace, which is pretty good. I mean, they didn't put it below MySpace, which is really great. <laughs> LinkedIn? Oh, yeah. There's, and there's no debugger tool. Like with Facebook, if you're posting something and you're testing it and you're using their, um, and you, you're just see, seeing the same results, you can force it through their debugger tool um, to do, basically just remove the cache. And if no one's familiar with cache, it's just a way of kind of remembering what you already posted so it doesn't have to pull the information all the time. Um, I was going to dig into a little bit more into the tools. Can I ask one of course, yeah. Um, if I'm setting up a site for a, a new business, a small business, um, should I be counseling them to create a Facebook presence and a Twitter presence and all that just from the perspective of their Google search ranking? Leaving aside questions of exposure, does any of that help them? If they're willing to be active on it, I would say it's, it's helpful. Um, if they're not going to be active on it, I, I'll register like the Twitter handle just so we have it and maybe not push it around. Um, a, a dead social account's not really doing anything for you, but get rid of the egg on the Twitter, put your logo up at least. But yeah, I, I have found social is not, like, it, unless they're willing to maintain it, it doesn't have to be every day either. If they're just regularly posting things to that, um, then yeah, I, I would recommend it. But if they're not, they don't have the, the ability or the resources to kind of put some effort behind social, or if they know which, like say you're a B2B, focus on LinkedIn, like how much work you're gonna have to do on Facebook um, if you don't have the resources to do it. Some of the tools we've uh, been liking using, import and export, uh, pretty powerful if you're switching back and forth between SEO plugins. Uh, I switched this one from all-in-one to Yoast for this talk, um, and we were able to quickly just export what we had in Yoast. Yoast uses a, a different uh, database entry than uh, all-in-one, so if you did all your keyword work and you've um, uh, updated, added your keyword, you've done your title and your description, uh, this import-export tool is really handy. File editor is really cool too. If you're willing to go in and play with your HT access, I highly recommend you don't if you don't know what you're doing though. Uh, Robust.txt is a little bit more forgiving, but with an HT access, you can really mess things up. But you can also do redirects uh, immediately right there uh, can, and control a lot of a uh, aspects there. The bulk editor I find really useful, especially if you've gone through, you've done your keywords research, you have a giant spreadsheet, you've got your URL, you know what your focus keyword is. You don't want to go into each individual post. There's probably like three clicks for accessing each post. Uh, you can go in here and basically do each page, and there's not a whole lot of pages to this, do the, your high-level Yoast information right off the bat. Um, and then the last tool in here... Uh, the text uh, link counter, which was a new tool to me. I hadn't played with it right now, but, or I hadn't played with it until uh, a few weeks ago. But basically, uh, interlinking is a great way to pass an authority around your site. So if you're referencing uh, parts of your site in, say, your blog content, let's say you're a hotel. We deal mostly in the hospitality tourism. Uh, and we'll have a chain that has, like, three locations. And if they're mentioning staying in South Beach for one of the locations, um, it's great for them to reference, to not only just pass on that authority, but uh, you can play with the anchor text and get 
a little bit of a signal to Google, just basically saying this anchor text is related to this page. So attribute that, inf that text to that page. Uh, the text link counter tool allows you to see at a high level, and if you go into pages, and I don't, you can see basically how many, that's eh, probably not going to show up, but um, I'll go back in here. Uh, basically what you can see is how many links you're linking out to and how many pages on your site are linking to that site. So it allows you to kind of control how you're pushing your authority around. Um, that's pretty much all I have. So I'd like to open it up for more questions. If, uh, if let, does anybody have any questions? All right, cool. I'll go with you first. I'm not creating from one site to another. So the initial site had, you know, fairly decent SEO. Mm -hmm. Are you going to follow the same URL structure? Are you like are you switching from WordPress to WordPress? Yeah, oh yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yes. And you know, titles for the blog posts as an example. Yeah. I mean if you're using the same tools, you can basically export your uh, your your meta information, your titles and descriptions, what keywords you're focusing on from the, the previous site to the new site. Uh, one technique we like to do is we'll take, uh, we'll open up analytics, we'll segment out organic traffic, and we'll look at the last year to find out what pages are driving organic traffic. Export those, and there's another tool that I included on my uh, the page that I had the link for called Screaming Frog. The free version will allow you climb, climb, uh, crawl up to 500 uh, URLs. So you could take that list of URLs, and if you have a dev site that you're working with, sub out the domain for the dev domain and then run that list through to find out if they all resolve to a 200 status code. 200 status code basically means that it's a success, the page exists. If you see uh, uh, 404, that means you've got to go and explore that. You might have to set up a redirect. If you do see a redirect, I highly recommend taking that redirect list and going to the, a couple columns over what the resolving URL is and crawl that as well just to make sure because it's only going to go through one step and make sure that what you're redirecting to is actually the right page. Yeah, no problem. And watch your traffic after you go live, just to make sure that it, and if, I mean, there's lots of resources out online. If you start seeing stuff tank, and expect a little bit of fluctuation, um, you're not changing domains or anything, eh? You should be more or less fine, especially if you're going from WordPress to WordPress. If you're going from Drupal to WordPress, and I, I know there's a couple people in the room that I work with that have done these transitions, that can be uh, a little more challenging. Yes, yourself. Yeah. Trying to understand. I generally like to look at the low ones first because I mean they're going to be easier wins, but then sometimes they're low for a reason. Um, and the competition level keywords everywhere will give you a bit of a, a competition level. I think it's out of one, um, and so it'll be point. And so you start kind of at the lower ones and work your way up. Uh, medium ones uh, are a possibility, uh, and then if you've got something that's high level, it depends on kind of what you're working with. If you've got an established brand, you can probably go after high level ones, but you're going to have to put resources behind it. I think a lot of that turns into like backlinking building campaigns, which can be very time, in uh, time intensive. Um, so not like, yeah, there's not, I haven't had a, I don't have a rule of thumb, unfortunately. I wish I did. Um, it is by case by case, but I definitely start with the lower ones, look for those opportunities there, and then work my way down. Yes. Um, maybe you touched on this already, but you had mentioned Google Analytics, right? Yes. And my question is, like, have you used other plugins for analytics? Like, like is there benefit to having like Monster Insights or whatever? Like, most of my clients, like, we just use. Mm -hmm. But they're always asking me, like, but I want to see more, and it's like, yes, you can pay for like tools that'll give you more, right? But I'm wondering. <coughs> Short answer, no. I find Google Analytics does everything I need it to do. Yeah, 
This gentleman, is Enrique, in the front row is definitely the guy you want to kind of pick the brain of afterwards. But one thing I found very powerful, uh, Google Data Studio right now, because you can pull in a lot of information and create something a little more client friendly in a dashboard format that you can change. Uh, you can change date ranges. You can change what you're comparing to. I find that's really good. Uh, and you can also tie in external resources as well, all through Google Sheets, which is pretty powerful. Um, but other than that, no, uh, analytics, uh, tying it in with your Search Console, um, those I found have been very strong. It's a bit weird how like, you do look at what you plug in for something and you compare the data. It's weird to me that half the time it's different. Like, I don't get that. But then I just, by default, I just trust Google Analytics because I'm like, well, that's obviously going to be the one that is right. Right. It's just it's strange. But anyway, that's a conversation for you. No, that's fair. And yourself? For like defining a focus keyword? Yeah, for each page and then wanting to kind of find variations of that for each new blog post. Right. And having them all relate back to the cornerstone content in some way if possible. Good question. Um, so, and I'll try to paraphrase that. So you're basically trying to figure out what's the, um, what kind of phrases you're going to use for your, that secondary content that's supposed to drive the, the main content? That Think about the intent. Um, if what is GST is the the phrase you're going after. Um, there's no real sweet spot, unfortunately. I'd say uh, you got to kind of find, and it's hard to kind of get out of like you'll start searching for that term like GST, and you got to start thinking maybe about taxes. Like if you're doing if you're using any of these re keyword research tools and you're you're digging through GST, you're not going to get terms for taxes specifically. Um, so. I, there's not really a sweet spot so much as just trying to think what your users are asking and how can I answer that. Is, yeah, that, that does help. Okay. Is there a limit on how long this long tail keyword should be? No. And it, it doesn't have to be a long tail keyword either. It doesn't have to be what is a GST number. You could use GST number. It's probably going to have a higher volume. Um, but your intent is to rank for what is GST number. But that allows you to kind of play with how your wording is as well, so you're not always using the just immediately what is GST. You don't want it to sound really stuffy, like you've just plugged in the keyword as many times and all those variants. I'll see like with a lot of tools, they'll tell you like I'm tracking three different keywords and they're going to say, oh, I write the meta description, like what is GST, what GST is, like include each one of those phrases in your meta description. No one wants to read that. That's not going to lead to a click through. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. I got five minutes left, so hopefully two questions. Uh, Devin? Yes. And the schema data is a quite large set of uh, options there. Have you, in your experience, ever seen any downside to adding additional schema data? No. Not, not yet. Um, as long as you're not trying to game the system. As long as the information you're marking up is relevant to what the content is. If you're trying to, like, include star ratings to a page that doesn't have any star ratings to it, just to kind of have it. Now, I have seen that work in the short term. But then with time, Google will kind of catch so on. So as, as long as the data is like, factually correct, there's no downside there? Not that I've seen yet, other than maybe increasing a few extra lines of code. That's about it. Yeah, in the back. Hey, Dave. Right. <laughs> I'd say just try to answer the questions that people that are looking for your product are asking. 
and try to find out what the phrases are getting searched the most using tools like that keywords everywhere answer the public it's a great uh, way to kind of get that going as far as selling it to a client I mean organic traffic everyone knows paid traffic will get you up there really quick organic traffic as, as a whole is a it's a longer game but it's it's more sustainable um, it tends to be a little more upfront work but it, it'll uh, it'll pay for itself over time yeah sure You'd always have to pay to maintain a paid position, right. but not the organic. Will it affect your organic search ranking later? Indirectly, it can, yes. Um, whereas, like with paid, it's a way to kind of uh, boost brand awareness. So, say somebody's searching something and you don't rank for it, and you're paying for that term, and you're constantly up there, people start associating your name with that, and we'll start searching your name outside of a paid result. So, that's kind of a way a paid can indirectly influence organic traffic. Yeah. It generally drives a lot more branded traffic. So if you're building a brand, it's better to go... Paid first. <laughs> Paid first, yeah. If you want to boost, if you got the budget... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but the, the question was basically, if, if you're trying to build a brand that doesn't exist, I, I would highly recommend going for a paid campaign first. Uh, and, and generally speaking, with paid campaigns, you want to look at who your top competitors are uh, and, and start bidding for their terms. Uh, it's going to drive their cost up for their paid campaigns. Um, but it's a great way to get yourself out there and in people's minds for terms that they're uh, cert that your competitors searching, or sorry, that relate to your competitor. Got time for one more question if anybody's got one. All right, cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's just a guide. It's just supposed to give you, and like, I like the there's a handful of the developers from uh, Verb here. Um, and like we'll create things in like uh, content type boxes that don't that Yoast can't read, and it'll be like, oh, you don't have you don't mention the keyword. I'm like, yeah, there's like six different boxes on this page that mention the keyword at least three times. Like there's, it, it's just meant to be a guide. If you're going with like a default WordPress site, it's it's a nice guide, and if you're just kind of getting started, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would say tags are a great uh, way because. Um, not tags in your categories, but tags with your categories. Um, is it important to have tags and categories? Uh, categories are like that high level taxonomy where tags are kind of sub. Um, so categories, I would keep them available so people can find them in, in search results. When it comes to tags, um, it helps you organize the information. It also helps crawlers to get deeper into the site and index all the pages. As you're developing content, as years go by, some of your content may be great, but it gets buried. It's no longer the most recent thing. Um, having those tags there allows uh, liked information to be kind of co um, correlated. Oh, one more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two Chrome extensions that I like to use um, are Keywords Everywhere. Uh, and then I like the, the schema plugin as well. Um, then as far as WordPress specific tools, uh, Yoast is in there. That's the one I like to use. If you want to get into PageSpeed, that's another conversation. There's a few that I've been playing with that are pretty uh, handy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'll uh, put up the site again here just before I leave. I did uh, include a, this uh, URL, wordcamp2018.seobrunch.com. Uh, it does have a list of everything I've talked about here, and there's some Chrome extensions on there. There's a few WordPress plugins, and there's a few uh, standalone tools as well that I recommend. Oh, make that a little bit bigger. Sorry about that. WordCamp2018.seobrunch.com. Great. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Thank you, yeah. Mike.